Yes, I'm honoured to be invited to Radical Anthropology. And I know I'm, I'm should I say this, that I, I'm, an, I'm aware of being a very, so, somebody who could be a very conservative sort of person or a conventional <laughs> sort of person, but there is this little sort of twist in my uh, family, if that's the word. Uh, you mentioned Robin, and in one of our books he says that how he's descended from a guardsman who, um, who, who was at the Battle of Waterloo. And I can say, I can say yes, well, William Gowlett was in, the, uh, was in the Napoleonic Home Guard. <laughs> but his chief claim to fame was, was that he married Hannah Turpin, daughter of Richard Turpin. <laughs> and you think that actually that doesn't, if you think that doesn't quite fit because of the date, that this is the nephew of Richard Turpin. And I think the thing that is, strikes is that there are no other Richard Turpin baptised in England for 50 years. And such was the power of the notoriety of saying don't. And I think here's the... Here is that family saying, yep, yeah, we're going to have our Richard again. <laughs> um, and the other thing I can just throw in uh, is being in a pub in North London, which is a great privilege again, there is, and I vie with it in Google, there is a pub called The Gowlet in South East London. And who knows, maybe one day I might, I, one day I, I might give a talk uh, there too. Uh, here, here to start. Um, but from that to far, which I think is, I, I enjoy this is a slightly controversial thing. It, it is controversial. And again, it's that, you know, you, you've got to be a little bit awkward perhaps to uh, hang in with, with far, and that's fine. So let's get into it. <coughs> Ideas about far, how we got it. And the thing for me is partly that I can't put a trowel in the ground, it seems, without finding far. So when you get engaged with it in that way, you've sort of got to do something with it. And I think especially to reach out to the anthropology and its theory. But I noticed that what you do in radical anthropology is really look at the big thing about, well... How are we human? How did we become human? And I think when we look at the problem of far, it really fits in there. It's, it's quite important in the, in the big frame of becoming human. But we kind of go in cycles, so we kind of overlook far for 50 years, and then we get carried away on far again. But, it, but it's always there. Now, again, mentioning Robin Dunbar, it fits in, in some way with this strange business in human evolution that our brains that are so expensive in energy have become so big in such a short period of time. So if you contrast with that chimpanzee ancestors, then at the beginning their brain will be 400 cc, the end is still 400 cc whereas our brains in the two and a half million years have, uh, the brains from our ancestors on have grown three times and I think that's really an enormous thing it's one of the few facts one of the most definite facts we've got that you, you can see there so it's something to something to explain and it's the fact that you don't have it happening in the other apes that I think really emphasises how much you've got to explain it in us. Now for Robin, and I, I go along with a lot of this, it's very much about social cognition, it's about group size uh, and interactions and so on. We as archaeologists, or those of us who are archaeologists, sort of struggle to expl ex explain our um, bit of it. But in there, what we're trying to explain is, is really how it happened and how it was fueled because it really is expensive so our brains are taking i mean they're three <coughs> three percent of our body weight now these brains but they're taking 
something like 25% of our energy and sometimes more than that. So we, we do have to sort of explain it and fire, it turns out, is really an important thing in this because it helps to give us the high quality diets that are necessary for fueling the bigger brains. But that doesn't really tell us when it happens and how it happens, so let's sort of struggle away with it. And I think where it's controversial is that immediately it's something where people fall into early camps and late camps to a remarkable extent. So on the left, you'll see there are the people who think that early fire started, as used by humans, started more than one and a half million years ago. And then there's quite a strong group, especially in Europe, of people who believe that it all started only 400,000 years ago. So there's a huge difference in those two points of view, which is quite healthy because it shows us <coughs> we, we ought to be able to argue about that and bait it, get evidence and find out about it. And the social brain, again, led me further into this, and I actually find that in a funny way I'm stretched out between two of the big biological beasts <laughs> who are there um, because Richard Wrangham of, at, at Harvard is the author of the cooking uh, hypothesis, and he very much believes that, you know, leaving the archaeology aside, leaving it aside what we find, that there has to be an early conversion to eating cooked food to um, explain the diet changes that were necessary then and the growth, the subsequent growth of the big brain. So for him, he says it can only happen once, probably has to happen quite rapidly. You can't go back to living off uncooked food and he sees it happening at this early date. Well, I, 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 I explained just that little bit more on it. Why the, why the big need for the diet change? And I think the thing there is that our earlier ancestors and the apes could probably live very largely off fruit and herbs as the chimpanzees and gorillas do now. But if you move out into the bush and savannah, you, uh, you're in a much more seasonal environment. You, you can't get through the dry season in particular. And you have to turn to eating more roots and tubers. You have to turn to eating meat. And he says and believes that you can only do this by switching to cooked food. Now, Robin, as another of the big biological beasts, is more convinced by the social brain. He says the early brain size increase isn't enough to need to be far fueled and he sees it more uh, uh, as going with the increases in brain size that you get roughly half a million years ago. So he comes down to around half a million years ago and somehow I, I struggled <laughs> to keep going uh, with them. But let's uh, explore that um, a little bit more. Um, now, let's turn into a little bit to anthropology and, and why it's so different from archaeology and why that's one of our problems in looking at all this. Uh, I think anthropologists, you won't see all the detail of that, but I think anthropologists are really interested in looking at relationships and largely I'm counting on observing the relationships to work out what's going on and to abstract from that. And I think archaeologists would love to do this, but the people are gone. So we can't do that direct thing of saying who is interacting with somebody else. And so we have to look for a kind of pattern where we, we, we're working at a kind of different level and look, looking for the patterns that we can get. And I'm saying really that we're inferring the social structure from the total material culture evidence rather than from looking at the relationships. And it's obviously much easier if you can look at the relationships. And incidentally, you've got a parallel thing in the life sciences, which uh, uh, Hind pointed out. Um, 
again the same thing observe the relationships get the structure and I'm saying that it's harder than archaeology but I don't you know we, we can't be kind of blamed by other disciplines for not being able to do it because the people have, the people have gone well let's follow into far and I think the structure of what I'll try and do now is to look a little bit at uh, the range of far and anthropology and then to then to look a bit at the record of the archaeology and what what we know from that so in the first instance there are this, there's this range of human uses of far which is what makes it so important to us so I don't really need to go through them or you can see them um, but it's important obviously helps us to keep safe if you're out and there are leopards around at night um, important for us for warmth not necessarily so if you're further south and people are very tough as Richard Rangham says it may be vital for the food preparation we certainly use it a lot in our technologies and if, if you think about it you know fire is um, the basis of nearly all the technologies that we're using here and now so. But then above all, what everybody likes, I think we all like, is the social side of it too and, and the huge importance and relationship with, with language and, uh, and ritual. But biologists have something of a problem with, with trying to work out an origin from all those things because they say that, that usually there is one main driver that, that makes an evolutionary development happen. So in what case, what, what would that be? Some people have said, well, oh, okay, the trouble with fire is there's no analogy with, with, with the animal world, unlike uh, tools, for example, where we've now got lots of other animals that we can see using tools. But if they say that, they are missing uh, the point that there are all these other birds, uh, mammals, uh, and even, to some extent, chimps, who are showing fire awareness and they are sometimes actually using the fire in their foraging. So the common theme is that they use fire in their foraging. So that would seem to be almost certainly the main original driver for people getting involved with fire. So, so we, we can sort of deny that, but it takes us away. The interesting thing is it, it takes us away from the usual thing of people sitting by a hearth. Um, you, you get the idea it doesn't really start l like that the hearth so if we go beyond the hearth then what you see and we've tested it plenty in the uh, experiments that we've done in southern Africa and so on is that provided it's not too hot and windy then you can walk with these fires you can see what's being exposed and if the resources are there whatever they are then you're getting an extra way in and that means that you find tubers um, you find birds nests you find the eggs you know, exposed by the fire hidden half cooked for you as the fire goes by um, burrows of rodents that you wouldn't get and then later on these fires will generate new shoots so you might explore the area again so so that you you know get nice fresh green things that that weren't there now i think what i'll come on to is that we could say oh yeah but this is just once or twice and i think the whole point really is that on landscapes it isn't just once or twice it's again and again and again so i think what we might be looking at in our human evolution is to try and trace it, to trace models to work from a very simple connection with far to a much more complicated picture. So the idea of this diagram is to say, yes, OK, it starts from a lightning strike up there, very often striking in the hills. And thanks to NASA, we now know, we now have wonderful maps that show us how many lightning strikes there are, where they are, 
and there are literally millions of them. So if you're living out in the wild and you, you know that world, you will become very lightning familiar and know what you might go to. And it's particularly when there's a first thunderstorm after the, after the dry season. Okay, I mean, it's not going to light wet vegetation. But at the beginning of the rains, you'll particularly get these strikes that are on vegetation that's still dry, and then off it goes. But what we might see on this diagram is that humans hiding on that landscape might be doing other things in other places. So what I put in was just the idea of, oh, an animal, and you might want a little hearth. And if you've got a dead animal, you might want a little hearth to do some cooking there. Or you might have your camp somewhere else. It would be nice to have your hearth there. So what you might have then is this need to follow the stretching of fire. So the story that we're looking for might not be just knowing about fire, but learning how to stretch fire across landscapes. And the other side of that would be stretching it through time. And we get a very nice example of the challenge there from Alaska. And the beauty of Alaska is, is that more than 90% of the fires that burn there have a natural origin. So you go to the rest of America, you've got wonderful forests and so on, but you've got any number of people dropping their cigarettes and so on, and you've got to disentangle all that. But in, Al in Alaska, it's about 93% uh, natural. And we can also, for Farouk et al., have, have presented the figures wonderfully. So on a summer's day in Alaska, in a million square miles, you will have a hundred big forest fires raging on any summer's day. And that means that if you were a human group as hunter-gatherers, you would always be within 50 to 100 kilometers of the fire. So stand on a high hill, you're going to know um, you're going to know there. So what it's showing us really is that for people who live on the landscape they're really going to know the fire and know that it's there. But the trouble up in Alaska is that all these fires burn in the summer. So it's all over by September to October. So again the great challenge to our early ancestors is to find ways to stretch this fire um, onwards. And I think you'd find probably the same thing uh, in Africa, that you're trying to stretch the far from um, the end of the dry season and stretch it through the wet season. Now that's the challenge. And what I sort of argue about this is that, is, is that we as archaeologists then shouldn't be totally besotted with our little hearths and whether or not there were hearths, because it's a much bigger sort of behaviour problem than that. Is, is to how you master what you need to do on the, uh, on, on the landscape. And um, in a way, this is be, the reaching out to that little bit of common ground between people like Rangham, Dunbar, or Will Robrooks, who believes in later far, that it's going to be out there all the time, and you're going to know it there all the time. And then the question is, how much are you actually uh, using it? Well, um, Let's have some more anthropology. So the, the root of that really is, is, is that the natural fire is always there, but somehow we've got into much more elaborate use of the fire. And I think the fun of anthropology really is to see just how tied it, in it is. Once you get outside our kind of society, where we've done so much to build fire out of our lives uh, in the last hundred years. Um, I've got a wonderful example there of that fireplace. Um, um, but you see it every, every, everywhere, um, really. But fortunately, uh, there are other uh, examples. Now, I think here's a really interesting example about fire use um, on 
uh, landscape. And here we have Australian groups who were only, I, I don't like to use the word discovered, I mean, they were the only in contact with Westerners from uh, 1953. But because they were in severe drought and under other pressures, then they began to go to the mission stations and their classic patterns of life used to, started to change rapidly. And what this shows clearly is that they had a very elaborate pattern of fire farming up to that time and that within a generation this was gone. So the figures here, if you can see them, I, I think, I'll just check in case you can't see them. So the people of the Matu, they lost this in a generation the aerial photographs show that in 1953 in this area there were 846 measurable fire footprints whereas in 1981 it was down to four big natural fires. So the control gives you lots of little fires doing what you want to do with them. Um, and the areas show that. So in 1953 the mean burnt size was just 64 hectares whereas they're up to over 50,000 um, now so that is a uh, collapse and you see um, a high diversity patchwork that's just gone to a sea of grass um, in uh, um, a generation um, okay well, well there are other things that are uh, equally perhaps relevant but um, perhaps a little bit more sort of cheerful than that. Um, so there are many many examples but I, pick, I like this one about the Hanzu, the Hanzu people in Tanzania who use fire in really all their rituals and they have this nice thing of using the grandchildren. It's really important that it has to be the grandchildren who helped to address the ancestors and to make the fire. So the grandparents sort of set this up. And then the grandchildren do it by a fire drill. So they've got a, a wooden hearth, the solid bit that you drill, and then the drill, and then they can do it by hand or, or with a bow. And what we're told is, is that the granddaughter and the grandson, it has to be one of each, involved and they swap roles so it's not just one doing the uh, drilling and the other they swap roles and then after a few minutes they get the fire going um, and that for just one example of this great importance but what I like about this and the book doesn't say it uh, 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 and so on but I, I think it's so is that what is really important is of course it's a role that if the children can do that for the ritual purposes, they can also do it for practical purposes. And when the other people, parents are coming home tired with the gathered stuff uh, uh, or, or from the hunt, then these children are going to be reliably making that uh, fire there. So it doesn't say that, but you can see the likelihood that these things might be uh, interacting there. There are plenty of other examples from southern Africa. Um, because there are examples from all around the world and I like Alan Barnard's uh, description with the sun and he points out the kind of thing that we have to be slightly careful about the sun can only light a fire I mean, ignite a fire if they also carry out the ritual so because of that Again, they've got a good reason for trying to keep their fires burning. It's not because they can't light them, but if they light them, they've got to go through the ritual and, and, and so on. And again, that may well have a, 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 sort, of may well have a sort of practical purpose um, as, as, well as, the, uh, as well as the religious one. Um, but, you know, um, we, we have to be a little bit... A lot of these things just give us little lessons about what to be careful about. Now, there are endless myths, once we bring language and religion into it, as to how people first got their use of fire. 
and these are all around the world. Um, so this one is described in uh, short transcription of the Hosa and Somi from Southern Africa. And it's just one of these many versions. And very often animals used to have the fire and humans somehow got it from them. It's just nice. And in this case, it's Mantis, who is having a kind of war with the ticks. And the ticks infect the sheep. So up to this point of the story, the ticks are in charge. And the ticks are civilised and uh, 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 managing everything. They've got their houses and everything. But they make the mistake of beating up poor old Mantis. And so Mantis then uh, goes and sorts them out and takes um, the fire from them for humans and after that then the ticks have to put up with living on sheep and um, trying to trying to drink drink their blood so it's just one example and I know other people know other examples that we might um, come out later but it, it just shows the way fire can re reach into so many different things as we go through and I think the last bit of my um, little tour into anthropology here picks out just somehow the impact of fire. And actually, I shouldn't have put the lettering across that because that's a bushfire in Kenya. You, you, you can see about 20 miles away. And I think for a lot of us, if you see that, we've got that sudden feeling is a bit like sometimes seeing a very powerful cloud formation or something. You just want to go there and see what's going on, what's going on. And I found that Wendy James brought this out a little bit in her book, The Ceremonial Animal, and she talks about Wittgenstein and ceremonial, and the idea that nature can give us sort of natural ceremonials. So seeing uh, the fire might be uh, sort of one of those. And another person I like uh, from a previous generation, Leslie White, um, American anthropologist, who was concentrating about on, on the idea of symboling. So I like the symbol, that fire. If you know what that fire is, it's a kind of symbol of let's go there, there might be something, and so on. But the last uh, side to that, I think, is really this, that when you get involved with the fire, it does what Wendy James is saying there, of giving you a sort of daily ceremonial in the way you handle things. And the diagram here contrasts the life of, at, at the top, it contrasts the life of the gorilla on the left and a human life on the right. So the gorilla gets up in the morning and does a good bit of eating, um, has a good nap at lunch time, well it's not lunch time, a good snooze, and then eats again through the afternoon. Um, it looks almost as if they stop for tea and then at dusk they go to bed. So all the apes go to bed. And the first person who, who pointed this out to me was actually Adrian Cortland, the chimpanzee expert. Yes, the name. He said it was so striking in West Africa that just as the chimps went to bed, the humans were just getting going. Uh, and there, I think, you see that, right? That actually, about now, or about an hour ago, is biologically our maximum alertness time when the apes are just going to bed. So we've probably got a genetic basis for this that we've stretched our day so much um, that we're awake probably 16 hours, um, whereas the apes only 9 or 10 hours. So there's something very big that's happened here because of fire. And, of course, Robin lighted on this too, um, that, yes, the extra social time. Can we explain the extra social time in the evening and the costs and benefits of it? So, And then again... If your hunters and gatherers going out for fire, managing fire, keeping it going, then again, it's actually going to do all kinds of structuring things to the way you go through the day. Um, and it probably depends who's staying at home. I mean, we know from the Hadza that sometimes the same fire kept going 
for more than 100 days. So, um, but there's a gathering group who are probably relied on to get the fuel. That's another thing we've found. We found that even in our own field work. Every day you stay in one place with your camp, it gets more costly because you have to go further to get the wretched firewood. Um, and and it, it eats out a ring. And, and it's, a, it's a very powerful sort of cost and benefit uh, thing. Um, and then uh, if somebody else, for whatever social reason uh, or economic reason, is, is doing hunting, um, then they can't be collecting material for fires at the same time. So it actually forces division of labour. Simply having any kind of fire forces uh, divisions of labour and a management strategy. So this is one of the reasons I'd argue that it's so powerful in, uh, in human evolution. Because if you do it at all, you've, you've got all this complexity coming uh, and forcing itself on you. Now, I'm going to change gear at this point and switch to the archaeology. I just want to see how we're doing. We're doing all right. I think we'll be all right for time. It's okay. So, I hope you're sort of sold on the fact that fire could be really important in human evolution. Um, and it's got this massive number of interesting directions that you can follow it in. There's a huge literature, uh, and um, I, I know I've not had time to follow a fraction of the myths and the implications and so on. But if we turn back now to the archaeology, then let's hope it ought to be able to answer some of these questions as to how far back it sort of goes. But it gets a little bit difficult because most burnt stuff we lose. We don't have a lot of... <coughs> we really don't have a lot of sites in the first place and probably only one in a hundred... I would guess one in a hundred of the sites that we get has actually got any kind of burnt material on it. So it's tricky and you need some luck. Now... Recently, to get more insights, we've been working with James Brink uh, at uh, Bloemfontein in South Africa. Um, now, Florisbad is an open air museum, and the point of doing this burning work on the landscape it, it is that the vegetation, sorry, the vegetation around Florisbad has become very degraded through past overgrazing if it can be um, restored through a burning pattern, which is happening now, then it can be restocked with antelope in the near future. And James's plan is to, have that happening, is to have that happening this year. So that's the rationale for it, not that we wanted to go out and, and burn things to collect. Um, but it's very, very incidental. Um, and just alongside Flores Bart is a, is a little uh, game park called Suit During. And there there had also been accidental fires. And on one occasion, we were even able to get to one of these fires while it was, while it was happening. So we learned things from this. And in some ways, they, they show us why it's hard. So in some ways, you're doing the experiments and you're actually finding out why it's a bit harder than you thought. So one of the ones we find here is that if there are animal skeletons lying on the ground, then if one of these fires passes, the bones get burnt. So you've got to be extremely careful on saying, well, it's burnt bone, therefore it must be human activity. Um, and it really, it really brings that home. So these are an antelope... Um, I can't remember which antelope it is, but you you can see the charring of the bone there. Um, on the other hand, one that's more encouraging for us is that when a tree burns back into the roots, it actually makes these complicated patterns, and we can distinguish that from a half. So a half is normally sort of bowl-shaped. It burns a bit into the ground, whereas these tree roots do this kind of thing. And then, I like this one because you can see the termites' nests exposed by the fire. But we learned that animal dung burns this tremendous 
temperature up to a thousand degrees and that was quite useful because if you read archaeological papers you'll find that people are quite dogmatic and saying well a human fire burns in this temperature range a natural grass fire is lower temperature than that and so on and it's just absolutely not so I mean it's going to be really confirmed to us and here you've got the pieces of animal dung burning at a higher temperature than, uh, than a, a campfire uh, but at the same time people would be would, people would probably know about this that yeah uh, and, and after the fire you see all these little plumes of smoke and this is this is the animal dung still burning so if you learn that you would know that, if, uh, that well we can keep this dung um, and it will keep this fire going but on the temperature front we found really that a grass fire really does pass very fast as people say so the idea, what people have argued is that the grass fire passes so quickly that things don't get really all that hot and that's why you can distinguish it from a campfire and the reason that isn't true which we've seen um, documented so well by this is that everywhere there's a little bush then the fire hangs onto it and the temperatures go higher absolutely in the same range as, as campfires so again it, it's something to learn um, so I think you can learn a lot from foraging um, about the and the campfires but in some ways I think we've learned there's actually a little bit more difficult as an archaeologist you've got to be even more careful than we thought now what is the big picture let's just turn to that for the last bit of this um, here are some big questions when did they first get involved with the fire at all when did it become essential uh, and then when does it link with these other things that are much more important I just put a sort of stab at some figures there and I'm not sure personally that we should be convinced by any of them as because somebody says so but they must have been aware of the fire they just are aware of the fire on those landscapes so I think that happened way back it became essential to cooking if you follow Richard Richard Rangham at 1.7 million essential for the brain following Robin Dunbar around about 0.8 million and then from then on it might also have interlinked with language and you've got another question that I sort of left out a little bit but when does it become really fancy fire so using natural fire is wonderful but to be able to say oh damn it's gone out <laughs> where the matches is a is a different thing again and on that one I just throw in a little speculation that we know roughly that they're beginning to have string because we've got the beads and there are holes in the beads for the string so we know roughly that by 150,000 they've got string and if they've got string then there's a possibility they've got the first bows um, going but that's pure spe I and mean, otherwise that's pure speculation and until we get a really wonderful wonderful find um, we, we won't really know that bit so um, last little bits to go through let's just look very briefly at the fire evidence and then I'll uh, wrap it up um, we've got only two sites that are as old as one and a half million years when it might first have been starting these are Chesawanja and Kubifora in Kenya and the problem with both of them uh, we hope that we'll see them both reinvestigated I think but the problem is them, with them is that you've got burnt material and it's with human artefacts and it's with bones and so on but how do you prove a connection I mean Chesawanja you've got these three things together but how do you prove that there wasn't one of these bush fires nearby and that the bits of baked clay then 
just floated down into the other art artifacts and so on. And I've never really been prepared. I mean, we dug this site. I've never really been prepared to talk it up um, be because I, we just can't really be quite sure. And at the moment, the same is true for Kubifora. I think what we can say from them, though, is that definitely humans were in the same environment as far again. So again, they knew about it. Two sites, that, uh, there, there's Chastawanandra again, we waited ages and ages and ages to get there um, and managed to get there a few months ago and I hope we'll be able to, again, a little bit of baked clay. Is that you in the picture? There. It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit more easy to sell really are two South African sites that are about a million years old. These are Swartkrans and Van der Vecht cave. And both of them have got fire evidence. Now, Van der Vecht, it's hard to see that that could be natural fire when it's inside a deep cave. Mm. And there are lots of materials, the kind that people like, like grass for beds and, and so on. At Swartkrans is a little bit different. Here's the collapsed cave of Swartkrans. And there's a nice museum model, if you can see it, of people um, supposedly keeping warm by the embers and so on. Swartkrans is quite an elaborate story again, but I think the thing is that there's quite a lot of bits of charred bone at Swartkrans, and it's turned out that some of those bits are the bits that have got cut marks on them. And it's the association to me of burnt bone, and it's the bits with cut marks, that suggests very, very strongly that, that there is human contact and control of fire probably a million years ago there. The other one that's extremely powerful, really, is the marvellous work that's done at Geshe Benat Yaakov um, in Israel that dates to about 700,000, and it shows repeated burning which again seems to be one of the best indicators of human presence because natural fire doesn't return all that much in the same place. So if you're in one place and you've got fire again and again and again, then that's quite convincing. And they also have little things that look like hearths. So personally, I, I, I would accept this site, but um, not, not everybody does. And we'll just come on sorry, to that. Sorry. Yeah, they accept, everybody would accept there's fire evidence there, but some people would still be saying, well, we're not quite convinced that it's human control of the, of the fire, and it's a very hard thing to prove. So let's just turn to the last bit for um, Europe. And Europe is one of the reasons why people are very cautious, because you don't see evidence of fire older than 400,000 in Europe, when you'd really expect to. So the site of Arago in the south of France, a cave's up there, it's an absolutely fantastic excavation, more than half a million pieces recorded, but older than 400,000, not one bit of charcoal, not one bit of charred bone or anything. So it really is um, a kind of mysterious. Um, by the time you get to 400,000, 300,000, then yes, we've got other sites in Europe that do have fire. But there are two or three older than 400,000, which are so big and so well excavated that it's really hard to explain if they don't have fire. And then we've got these older sites in Africa, so how, how do you kind of explain that? Well, one thing, little thing that I kind of tried to um, argue with the excavator, the de Lumley, is to say that perhaps um, well, down, just 100 yards down the, down the uh, hill, the river comes through the gorge. So you see on the slide, the bottom left. And um, the point I can show you, there's the river gorge. Here it is again, there's the water. Now we have found there does seem to be a very strong link between fire and water on the sites that we know. So I just speculate, is it possible, and I don't want to upset the French over this, um, is it possible 
but actually they were having their halves down there yeah. um, and hadn't got the hang of carrying burnt stuff up into the cave. So is it possible that around 400,000 there was a big change in behaviour and suddenly they got much better at using the fire? So um, it's, it's, um, it's a hypothesis. But we do know that 400,000, that, that they're definitely using fire and the site we worked on at Beaches Pit in East Anglia gives a very, very nice example of this and it gives the kind of evidence that everybody would love to have for much earlier sites. So one of the things that we see at Beaches Pit is that somebody is sitting there making a stone tool, making a hand axe, the big thing there, flaking it, making it. And we have a wonderful sequence which, which uh, Jane Hallis and Tom Humphrey put back together. We've got a wonderful sequence of 30 of the flakes that can be put back together so we can trace exactly what was happening as that person was napping. Strike, 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 strike. And three of the flakes rolled forward into the fire area and they and they alone are burnt bright red. So, uh, sorry, using. <laughs> yeah, that look bad. Um, so there you are, one of the uh, so red how ones. Far this? this is four hundred thousand again. So we've we've seen at four hundred thousand in several parts of the world actually, we're suddenly seeing a really good fire control. Um, and our really big question, I think, at the moment is, do we accept the earlier evidence? Um, what, what is fooling us? Well, my last uh, um, two or three s slides. Um, there, are huge, there are a lovely number of uh, issues in this. Um, and I just throw out how, how related is fire to the origins of language? Um, is it just indirectly because the big brain is linked with both? Um, or is the fire fueling the big brain, helping us to have language? What do we know? But I think what we are beginning to see is that, is that these things are all tied together probably in our genetics in some way. And we do see evidence in the circadian rhythm uh, probably for some of the changes that give us the longer day and if that if that's a biological change that, that's involved with day extension then it could be a consequence of natural selection following the fire use um, and yes the big brains uh, that, that are fueled um, may be a necessity for the brain to develop greater intentionality greater higher levels of intentionality and um, that, that almost certainly does link link with language so we've got the possibility that these different things are tying together i've just picked out uh, some of the possible things there the brain size curve some of the events that might be linked with language but I think what's really interesting is that a number of our different problems go, uh, go together at the moment in looking at human evolution. So if you want anatomical changes that might help to explain language, then there are some very early ones around two million years. Um, like, for example, the mutation that gives us much weaker jaw muscles compared with, uh, uh, compared with apes. Um, possibly Broca's area showing. And then some much later ones, just under half a million, like the presence of an ear canal in Homo heidelbergensis that seems to tune to the right frequencies for language. And in the middle, this great big gap again. So there are so many things. The early and the late is kind of staying with us at the, uh, at the moment. Um, but almost in jest say don't let us think it's all about language because if you look at the gut um, then again we're at the bottom those are some apes at the top 
and you see we've developed a much bigger small intestine and shrunk the large intestine a lot um, and that ties in with this stuff too and it's, it's going to take time isn't it it's going to take time how much time is it going to take I think it's showing the change that, that we are eating more meat, we're eating more carbohydrates, we're eating more prepared food, and we're, we are eating far less greens um, and other vegetables compared with the apes. So if you imagine one of those uh, salad packs that you can get in the supermarket, mm -hmm. then the chimp, of, the gorilla's eating the equivalent of 100 of those a day. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a lot. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So we need small, dense packages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I mean, sort of in jest, but not in jest really, because that that fits into the picture. What's now, the white thing in that? Um, if you go back to the that, those uh, stomach. Oh, diagrams. it's the caecum and appendix. Is it what, sorry? Caecum. Cecum. Yeah, for prep, okay, go, I say. <laughs> yeah. Mm. You want to do this? Oh, <laughs> it's one, it's yeah. one of the other bits. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Talk about <laughs> I mean, I, I was confined myself to the appendix, actually. Um, we've got a much smaller appendix than. It's very large, big rabbits and things, so they have a lot of bacteria for jetting cellulose. It's and it's quite shrunk in us. So no, again, it's no. to do with digesting it's a large amounts of vegetables then, is it? Okay. Isn't it, uh, that bacteria, um, some, if it's the appendix, I think it's something to do with protection against um, or, um, bad organisms or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think actually, I to concentrate. I should have left it off, really. Yeah. I, think, <laughs> I, I think concentrate on the others. But I mean, because I think it's the, I think it's the, I think it's the, it's the change in roles of the small intestine and the large intestine that are the really big part of this, are the really big part of the story. And it's bec it's because of the carbohydrates and the meat and the cooking in the end, um, compare uh, and the much reduced uh, green plant. Uh, the smaller large intestine leaving energetic space for a much larger, proportionately larger brain, of course, I mean, that's a relationship between the brain and the gut. Yes, uh, you're, that's fair to, as far as we can see, is to bring the also the expensive tissue hypothesis into it that we can probably that that we're again we're only getting this um, large expensive brain at the expense of other things. So it's really probably only possible in terms of all these diet changes that in themselves are really forced. So to conclude on that, um, I'm Perfect timing. I want to say just to conclude is, is that I think there are three strands in fire, at least, that it's important to sort of separate in the research that we're doing. And particularly, I think there's a sort of primitive archaeology one that's just saying, is it a hearth or isn't it a hearth? You know, uh, does this show that they had fire or, or not? And yes, sure, if it is a hearth, it shows they did have fire control. But if we don't have it and don't find it, um, it's not answering the question at all, really because it's, it's such a, uh, another big issue. So I think the second big issue really um, is the human behavior, how we became human, and how we end up in the end with the power, the magic of the fire um, at the end. And I think the archeology span is helping us to, and will help us to, to try and separate these other hypotheses, say how much of this and how much of that do we believe in. And then the last one is really the fueling of biological change. Um, this is what we, I think we now increasingly see that fire is doing. Um, it's all 
in the works of these huge biological changes that we've gone through and then we get all the uh, benefits from it so I think all these early hominids I would say they certainly knew about fire and then it's all about the process of harnessing it for a very long time and it has no limits so I'll stop there thank you very much